Our scripture reading this morning is from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then... Will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This summer, we are taking time to just turn into different places in the Scripture. We're not in a series. Uh, We'll be in one in the fall, but we're not in one right now. And each week, I'm just taking an opportunity to ask the Lord what He would want to speak over us. And today, we're going to be studying from this Scripture that we've just heard, uh, John chapter 3. And, but you, always, you know that I always provide a message outline And so I want to invite you to just grab your worship guide Turn to the second to the last page there And have that scripture in front of you That message outline Maybe you'll even reach into the little seat back in front of you there And grab a pen or a pencil I'm going to invite you to circle some words Maybe notice some punctuation About the scripture that we're going to be reading from today You know this is a week that we celebrate our freedoms And what we're going to really look into today is a conversation that Jesus is going to have with a guy who was so knowledgeable and who sought out a private moment with Jesus but didn't realize that he really did not have the life 
and the freedom and the eternity that Jesus had come to offer. So today, on this Sunday after our independence celebration, I just wanted to turn to John chapter 3, verse 16. This very, very, is it the most, maybe the most famous scripture of all. Maybe the most memorized scripture of all, and read it in its context. You know, it's 26 words. It's 26 words that may be the most famous words in all of the Bible, and I just wanted us to dive in together. So if you have your pen, you got your outline in front of you, just want to invite you to read about this conversation that Jesus had with a guy named Nicodemus. John chapter 3 says, Now there was a Pharisee, you might want to underline that, there's a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Who is in the conversation? It's Jesus, this upstart rabbi, who has just cleared the temple. I'm sure he got some press from that. And Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee. Now, when you hear the word Pharisee, I want to If I could pull back away from you for a minute what you think, I wish I could. Because there was a time when Pharisee was a really good word. There was a time when Pharisees were the people who studied God and tried to interpret the Scripture for people so they could really know and understand who God was. Nicodemus had given his life to not only the education of the Scriptures, the knowledge of the Scriptures, but to the teachings that had come from so many rabbis before. And when it says he was a member of the Jewish ruling council, you've got to understand, he was one of 71 people in the Jewish Supreme Court. He was a person of influence. And he seeks out Jesus for a conversation. So we know who it is. Do we know where it is? Well, we don't know exactly where it's at, but we know it's in Jerusalem. We don't know where it's at in Jerusalem, but we know it's in Jerusalem because the Bible says it's right during the Passover. Jesus is in the holy city of Jerusalem for the Passover season. So the town is packed. It's crowded with people. I imagine that Jesus probably was, the Lord of the universe was probably hard-pressed to find a place to rest his head and have a bed. He's probably crowded into some space in some back alley of Jerusalem as he's there for the Passover, and it's when? At nighttime. We cannot know when it was actually happening in the ministry of Jesus, but we do know that Nicodemus comes to him at night. Now, that's particularly interesting because it was during the day that Jesus did his ministry. It was I mean, think about how many scriptures we have in the Gospels Almost all of them are happening in the daytime. It's in the daytime when Jesus is teaching and doing his miracles. Nicodemus seeks him out at nighttime. We don't know if it was in a little living area or in a little back alley. We don't know, but we know it was nighttime. And we don't even know for sure exactly why it's nighttime, but we do know this. This is probably a private meeting. If it wasn't nighttime, it was probably... It would have been a moment where there were other people listening in. It would have been another moment where other people were watching. Nicodemus seeks out Jesus for a little private moment, and I want you to watch how he starts the conversation. He starts it kind of like you would start it. Rabbi, we know that you are from God. Nobody could do the things that you were doing if they weren't from God. By the way, this is kind of a little small talk. You ever got into a conversation and you needed a little talk to get to where you wanted to go? This is what's happening. It's a little bit of small talk, but it's got a little sprinkling of flattery in it. Do you hear it? Right? And so he says these words to begin, and while he's just kind of hydroplaning and opening up a conversation, notice that Jesus doesn't, Jesus gets real deep real quick. Jesus doesn't stay on the top. Jesus is probably not impressed with his political degrees and his educational degrees and who he is. None of that really matters. Jesus is going to use this time to talk to him. Now listen, to talk to him about the most important thing. If this is a person who teaches others about Jesus, um, teaches others about God, if this is a person who shows them the way of salvation, Jesus wants to make sure he understands 
the way of salvation. So notice Jesus' words. Jesus says, very truly, uh, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. If you have your pen, you might just want to circle the word see. That was actually one of Nicodemus' jobs, to help people see and interpret, find God in their daily life. No one can see the kingdom of God unless, underline that, born again. By the way, this is a very risky encounter that Nicodemus has put himself in. He doesn't know what's going to happen in this moment. He doesn't know what kind of persecution might come his way. But I want you to think about how his risk was such a reward for us that we have this story. Very truly, I tell you that no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Jesus goes deep fast and Nicodemus is quickly lost. <laughs> he doesn't understand. It's clear at the outset. Nicodemus understands him to be talking literally born again, right? And so Nicodemus, have you ever been in that situation where you were talking to somebody and you didn't want to show your ignorance, but you could not track them? You did not understand what they were talking about? So you had to find some way to catch up, to get back up with, with to understand them? Notice what he does. It, it might even be with a little levity. Nicodemus looks at Jesus and he says, how can someone be born when they're old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. This is his way of saying, I, I don't understand. Can you help me out here? Surely that can't happen, right? Jesus begins again with the very same words he started the first time. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water. Think natural birth, born of a woman, and the Spirit. You might want to notice the capital S there, born of the Holy Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but capital S, Spirit, gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. If you could only understand what's colliding here. Nicodemus' whole understanding of God was about what humans could do to please God. It was about gestures and good works and following laws. Nicodemus was an expert at knowing how you did the thing to follow God. And Jesus is not really interested in any of that because Jesus knows that works don't work. Jesus knows that, and works are how Nicodemus has made everything work. And so what's going on here is Jesus is confronting him with a new understanding. And it may be old to you. You may have heard it before. You may have known it. But the new understanding that Jesus is giving him is unless you are born again. By the way, that word again, if you have your pen, just circle it. Just circle that word again. There are two Greek words for again, and I'm not, I'm not going to go into all of, all of One of them is, is an action that is done repeatedly, not always by the same person. You want a great example? Think of pickleball or tennis. One person hits a ball over a net, and the other person hits it again, right? And then another person hits it again, and you go through this volley, and it's back and forth, and this, this action is again and again and again. That's one Greek word, but that's not the word that Jesus is using here. Yet the word that Jesus is using here is a word that is when someone does something and then they, the same person does it again and they repeat it. By the way, it reminds me that when I was born, I had very little to do with it. I had very little. I'm so thankful that my birth, I attribute my birth, how about you, not to just a mom and a daddy, but by God's will and by God's grace, he gave me life. What Jesus is saying here is that the God who gives life once, the physical life, must give life to the Spirit. You must be born again. Nicodemus is struggling to follow. And so when Jesus looks at him and says, wow, even you don't understand this? 
So we've talked about the who, Jesus and Nicodemus in a conversation. We've talked about the when, it's in Jerusalem, it's at the Passover, it's at nighttime. We've talked about the where, but you know what we've not talked about? The why. I wonder why John, the disciple, put this in his gospel early on. John chapter 3. I wonder why he put it here. I remember when I was at Lee University studying, uh, I was pursuing a couple of degrees, and one of them was in uh, a biblical education. I took a, a, one of my first courses was in the Gospel of John. And I learned, I loved studying the Gospel of John because in the Gospel of John, what I learned was John had had a chance to read the other Gospels, and then he wrote his. And he was very strategic in how he wrote it. I mean, there are seven, seven miracles that he wants to communicate that happened. There are seven I am statements of Jesus. There are seven conversations, very important conversations, and Nicodemus is one of the seven. Why would John want to communicate this so early in his gospel? And at the core of it, what John is trying to communicate is that Jesus is not just some rabbi. Jesus, Jesus is from God. And his testimony is beyond time. Notice these next part. Jesus says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the capital S, spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus is still lost. You are Israel's teacher and you don't understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, we testify what we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. See, John wants us to understand that the testimony of Jesus is not some earthly testimony. It's the Son of God. It's the kingdom testimony. He says, very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, we testify what we've seen, but you you people still do not believe our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness... So the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. And then we have this incredible 26 words. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life life are there any 26 words in all of the bible that are a greater representation of the gospel the good news of salvation 26 words that describe the mission of jesus why he came to our dusty planet 26 words that share with us who god is and why god did what he did 26 words that are the essence of of our freedom. Most people know those 26 words, or they've heard of them before, or they, they, if, if you said them, they might ring familiar, but they don't even know the next few words. Jesus goes on after that, and he says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light. Can I just pause there for a minute? I almost have to wonder, what, would it, what was it like to hear Jesus say that word in that moment while they're standing in a dark place at night? This is the verdict Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Just for a few minutes, I just want to go back to those 26 words, to that parade of hope that was there explaining salvation to us. And if you've got your pen, I just want to highlight some words here. Just my words that kind of identify little pieces of this and ways that we can think about what was offered to us in Christ's sacrifice. You got your pen? Fill in that first blank. 
God's love, God loves me unconditionally. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. Well, how did he love the world? Last week we talked about agape love, the the love that God gives that is this beautiful, relentless kindness, this goodness towards us that cannot be stopped. And the idea that God loved you, but he loved the whole world. He loved all in the world. Throughout all generations, he loved without condition. You know, I I love my kids. I love my wife. I, I know that you have experienced love like I have experienced love. But our love is so tainted and warped in so many ways, and we like to think that it is without condition. But if we were really to press things down the way, right, if somebody behaved a certain way, maybe we would have a harder time loving them. This is why we struggle to understand how much God loved the world and how he loved the world. God loved the world so much. He loves us unconditioned, without condition. He, his love, he loves you. Write this one down. God loves me sacrificially. God so loved the world that he gave. He moved. He took action. He didn't let his love be just something that was there. He took action to bring us somebody. There's a cost that was there sacrificially. Write this one down. God loves me personally. This is deeply personal. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. This was personal to the Father. He gave his son to free us. He gave his son to free me. Write this one down. God's love is limit. He loves me limitlessly. That whoever believes in him, he gave his one and only son, that whoever, whoever, whosoever, whoever, doesn't matter what you are or where you've been he loves you that much that whosoever believes whosoever i like to say it this way nicodemus was man he was a pharisee he had all these bars he had shown people how they could please god and jesus is trying to say no 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 he takes the bar and he lowers the bar so low and he says all you got to do is believe One of the reasons I love this is because children, get this, children, you know, all three of our children, Abigail, Andrew, and Alex, all received Christ sometime between the time they were five and eight years old because children, get this, they placed their faith, they believed in Jesus that whosoever believes. It's not complicated. He took the bar and he just lowered it so low and he said, anybody, This is a beautiful picture of the limitlessness of God's love. He loves me like that. And then finally, write this one in there. He loves me eternally. For God so loved that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes shall not perish but have eternal life. Life forever. They will not die. They will live forever by the Spirit's power. 26 words. Watch this. Everybody look up at me for a minute. 26 words. He so loved that he gave. We believe. We live. That's the gospel. That's the good news. He so loved that he gave, and we get to believe, and we get to live. It's so beautiful and it's so simple. And Nicodemus was struggling with it. Why? Because we can be so ethereal. We can be too smart for our own good sometimes, can't we? Right? If you're new to the Christian faith, or maybe you're just kicking the tires of Christianity, you know what I want to say to you? The Gospel of John right here is one of the best places to start. Because John is making it real clear what life in Christ really is all about. And by the way, if you are a seasoned Christ follower and you've been following Christ for decades, the Gospel of John is a great place for you to return to, to remember what your salvation is from. I don't know about you, but I need to remember that I was lost, that I I needed 
that kind of love and that kind of God who would give his son for me. I had no hope. He did it all. Today is a day of Holy Communion. The first Sunday of every month, we celebrate Holy Communion together. This is our way of remembering. And today, right here in the middle of the summer, on what you might call an independent Sunday, if you will, I want to remind you of the freedom, the eternal freedom that you've been offered in Christ. In the same way this past week that we all challenged to remember how good and how blessed we are, today is a good day spiritually for you to remember what Christ did. You know, Paul was writing one of his last letters to a protege of his, and in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, he said these words. I don't have it on the screen. I'm just thinking of it. He said, remember the Lord Jesus and his resurrection. He was telling Timothy, don't ever forget. And what I want to say to you today is, <laughs> the good news of the gospel is that on your worst day, on your day where you feel like you've got no hope, on your day where it seems like sadness is winning the day, or maybe grief happens, or maybe betrayal or hardship or hurt, on your worst day, remember. Remember Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Because your worst day is still a promise of eternity if you will believe. So in the next few minutes as we come to celebrate Holy Communion, it's a good moment for us to hold in our hands bread and hear the words that Christ Jesus gave his body for us and to place juice in our mouth and let it roll through our body and to remember it was the blood of Christ that washes away our sin, washes away all of our sin. And if that's the good news, here's the question for you. Why in the world would you get in your car or, 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 or move towards Monday without confessing your sin, being liberated and freed of it once more, and being set back on mission clean and forgiven and free? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe may have eternal life. This is the gospel that Jesus shared over and over again even to the last night that he had with his friends. When there was a loaf of bread sitting at the table, and Jesus reached out and he took that bread such a natural thing for us to have in our homes. But that night, he transformed it. The Bible says he took bread, he lifted it up to heaven, and he gave thanks for it. Would you do that with me? God, we thank you for bread. We thank you this just common. We have it in our homes all the time. We eat it all the time. But when we come to this day, a place of holy communion, it's just different. Bless it today that even as we take it to ourselves, it remind us of your love, that you loved us so much that you gave your son for us as a sacrifice. The Bible says he took the bread that was at the table, and after he prayed over it, he broke the bread. And he took the bread, and he passed it around, and he explained that his body would be broken for them. He invited them to take and to eat. And then the Bible says that Jesus took a cup at the table. He held it up. He prayed a prayer of blessing over it. Would you do that with me? God, we thank you for the fruit of the vine. Even today, as it touches our lips, it will be sweet to us. But we know it was horrific to you. It cost you everything. We thank you for your love. And we thank you that it is the blood of Calvary that forgives us and heals us and washes our sin away. We confess that every one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We desperately need, oh God, your forgiveness. So bless today this juice to be a reminder to us of your great love through the blood of Christ on the Calvary cross. He took that cup and he passed it around the table and he explained to them about a new covenant. Not a covenant of law, a covenant of grace, a covenant of mercy. Today, as we come to receive Holy Communion, 
We're going to receive via intention. If you've never done that, all you need to do is just place your hands and hear the words that as the bread is placed there, the body of Christ broken for you. And you'll take that little bread and dip it in that cup and then take it under yourself. And our prayer is that in the receiving of the bread and the juice, you would experience Christ and his love for you once again. If you're going to serve Holy Communion this morning and help us with this, I just want to invite you to come and Mark's going to begin to serve you as you're going to serve others this morning. And just a couple more words to you very briefly. If you want to be served right where you are, you, don't, you can't make it up here, just flag down one of our ushers. We'd love to come and serve you right where you are. If you need gluten-free elements, we have those available. And so when you come to receive, instead of placing your hands there, just signal to them that you need the gluten-free elements. We have those at every one of our stations. And lastly, I just want to remind you of something. We call this the Lord's table. It's not a Methodist table. It's not Dalton First table. It's the Lord's table. So all are invited. All. None of us deserve it, yet all of us are invited to receive His grace. Come, and may Christ meet you in this place.